Welcome to Second Take, the show that takes a look at the issues behind the news. South Africa is making some progress in its bid to use the upcoming climate negotiations as a platform to promote itself as a destination of choice for decarbonisation investment. Terence Kuma joins me to speak about the strategy and how it is likely to unfold. Hi Terence. Hi Chanel. What is South Africa aiming to achieve at COP26? Well, I think there's a, it's about the money in the end for South Africa. I think that uh, we are needing to go there with a, a coherent plan that we can show that we have bankable projects to decarbonize at a rapid pace and we can do it cheaper than most other countries. So I think we really need to get our, our, our program in place uh, and our offer to the international community in place and it's really going to require us to <coughs> probably announce a more ambitious nationally determined contribution. So to cut our emissions faster than we would have uh, otherwise done and use that uh, more rapid uh, offer as a way to fund uh, programs um, of decarbonisation, particularly around ESCOM, South Africa's state-owned electricity utility, which is our biggest emitter. And we know that ESCOM is in a bit of a sweet spot with regard to decarbonisation because they've got this very old fleet. Besides Madupi and Kusile, their fleet is sort of in that uh, 30 to 40 year age group. And we're going to start seeing the first power stations. Kamati will be the first, but uh, a number of four or three others that will be decommissioned be before 2030. So we've got this opportunity to repower and repurpose those power stations. And uh, also, we, if we accelerate slightly their decommissioning, we can also attract climate finance. And I think that's really where we're at. The Presidential Climate Commission's working hard on this. Eskom has been working on what they call a just energy transaction for a number of months now. They've got the Just Energy Transition Office that's been established. And they've got these potential project locations, these decommissioning power stations, the Kamati being the pilot, but the Hendrinas, um, uh, those sort of power stations, those older power stations that need to, the current place, that need to be decommissioned quite soon. And uh, those, the, the Just Energy Transaction is really about cushioning workers that will be affected and finding new alternative uh, propositions or work opportunities and for communities, nearby communities, who are, whose livelihoods are dependent and businesses on these. So I think really it's about getting our ducks in a row. There's less than 100 days to go before COP, and we need to make a clear offer. And then the other side of it is to tag this very much uh, to a, a suggestion that the world, the international community, that is uh, the rich world, which has disproportionately contributed to the high stock of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, which is now translating into climate change and with devastating effects in many countries. We're seeing fire and floods this whole year. It's become the story, a story narrative around the world, and it's going to intensify. And to say that, you know, that they need to mobilize and honor their commitments to at least mobilizing the $100 million a year for developing economies to mitigate and adapt, and then, if possible, to start ramping that up from the floor of $100 billion a year to somewhere above $300 billion to really allow developing economies to adapt and mitigate to climate change. The Presidential Climate Commission is moving to build consensus on a just energy transition ahead of COP26. Yes, I mean, they've been very active since their formation in December last year. The President chairs it, the Deputy Chair is Vali Musa, and they've been very consultative over those the last few months. Uh, everything they do is in the public domain. You can actually sit in uh, using your Facebook account and listen to the discussions. And it was no, the, the last, the latest discussion which took place uh, last week uh, was really about the electricity transition and really about aligning that electricity transition to this very narrow window of opportunity to raise international concessional finance for ESKIM's transition from where they are now, a high carbon emitter, to becoming a more fit for purpose utility in this new world where they're going to be broken into three, but the generation part of it needs to decarbonize its coal plants and hopefully get into green technologies, possibly in partnership with others. 
And then having the grid company, the transmission company, it's, it's a key enabler of the energy transition, really have that as a strong part of uh, um, the electricity supply industry, and then using its distribution arm as part of the, the necessary transformation that's going to take place. And I think really the, the Presidential Climate Commission is getting its head around this. So it really had its input around the nationally determined contri contribution or our decarbonisation pledge to COP26 and very much, as I said earlier, saying that we need to make an, a more ambitious offer to use that gap in, uh, between what we offered back in 2015 at Paris and what we offer now and show the delta and use that delta to crowd in uh, uh, climate finance from governments and the private sector around the world. What could a just transition look like? I think that is uh, really what is the unknown. What could it look like? And I think Eskom has really been doing a lot of work around that. And it's really, it's not, it's about coal, uh, protecting coal miners that have good jobs at the moment. These are well-paying jobs. These are secure jobs and have been in the system for many years. Coal-fired power station workers are, are protecting them. And uh, also those communities and companies that live off both the coal mines and the power stations and uh, are, um, really finding a way to p uh, allow these, these those that are most vulnerable to the transition from coal to renewables to benefit from this transition in a, a net positive way. So they must be net positive in terms of jobs, there must be economic activity. And I think that's not going to be limited. If we limited it to a like-for-like like energy job or a like-for-like like energy opportunity, I think it's going to be limited. So I think really Kamati is going to be the test case. See what repowering opportunities there are to Kamati in terms of uh, being able to use that um, grid infrastructure that's there, the power station site, to do either um, renewable energy or maybe green hydrogen um, to try and produce e electricity at that site. But at the same time, use all the opportunities around Kamati uh, for economic activity these power stations are highly water intensive and, um, these, and the water that comes from Kamati actually surprise the surrounding community. As the power station uses less and less water, there's obviously an opportunity to use that water in economic value adding activities, particularly around agriculture, which is generally job rich. Uh, I think the fear amongst especially coal mining workers is that a secure job in a stable location to an uh, situation where solar and wind jobs are really about construction of projects rather than stable one-site locations, how that's going to all pan out. And, and also this, if, if uh, workers are approaching retirement age, for instance, what sort of social protections do they get or their family, their, their, um, the, the, whether they will be able to retrain for this new economy, either in the, uh, directly in energy jobs, constructing wind and solar plants, or in these non-energy jobs around using the, utilizing the water that is going to be liberated for agricultural activities, for instance. What are the main risks to a successful just energy transition? Well, I think the main risk is that we don't seize this moment. Uh, there's going to be money available, um, and it's going to be a short window of opportunity, and we need to get our ducks in a row. We need to have our message clear and we can't have multiple messages. We can't have a policy debate around decarbonisation carrying on that's destructive, around our energy transition that's destructive or, not, or is disconnected. And I think that's unfortunately a little bit where we are at at the moment. I think the P, uh, Presidential Climate Commission is definitely starting to knock heads together and put us facing north. And definitely the work that Eskom has done um, around their just energy transaction is also helping to have a very uh, a large set of bankable, potentially, projects that we can show to the international community. So we need to have our message clear, and there's, it's definitely, unfortunately, there's still a number of strands on the energy policy side, as well as from the Treasury, which is, uh, is not fully aligned from what, what we can see with Eskom's plan. So Eskom and Treasury, I think, need to get their alignment fully in place. Um, Eskom's not talking about debt forgiveness or they are t talking about raising new concessional finance, but it's concessional, it's long-term, it's low cost, and it will help them 
with some of the, uh, the immediate financial challenges. Not the, it doesn't offer the full solution, but we need the National Treasury and we need um, Eskimi, we're talking off the same hymn sheet, and we need our, our government led by our president and then our energy minister to be talking off the same hymn sheets. And we've got a, just over 90 days to get our act together. And if we don't get our act together, we're going to see this window of opportunity close on us. Thank you. That's the second take show for this week. Thank you for watching and join us again next time for more news analysis. Also, don't forget to listen to the audio version of our Engineering News Daily email newsletter.